Let's talk about state variables and uh, path variables. Um, so for example, a state variable, things that are in that category are things like pressure, volume, temperature. What do all those things have in common? Well, our system, our system has a temperature. Um, we don't care whether we're taking it out of the freezer and bringing it to room temperature, or if we boiled water in it and we brought it back down to room temperature. We don't care about that history. We just care about its current temperature. Similarly, it has a volume. In the case here, it's a fixed volume, but we can imagine an expanding or contracting pot, something like a balloon. Um, again, we don't care what the balloon did in the past. Uh, we just care about its instantaneous current value, uh, and therefore we call its volume uh, a state variable. Now that can be contrasted um, with things where we do care about the past, um, in particular heat interactions and work interactions. We need to know what the past was on the processes that took place in order to calculate those quantities, and therefore those are called path variables. Now this distinction between state variables and path variables, especially the path variables, heat and work interactions, is one of the things that uh, uh, new folks to thermodynamics often require the most amount of time to really understand and start to use. So we're going to go through it today um, with some specific examples to help in that regard. One helpful way to start thinking about uh, path variables and state variables is to think about climbing up uh, a hill. Here uh, in uh, Boston, in, uh, in Somerville, I guess, there's uh, Prospect Hill, which has a nice uh, tower on it. Um, goes back, has some history to the American War of, uh, of Independence. Um, so let's set out as our objective for one afternoon to get ourselves up to the top of that tower. Uh, there are going to be some different ways uh, to do it. One thing we know is that however we do it, whether we go on Broadway and then Pearl Street and then Washington Street and then up the side, or whether we go on Stone Avenue and Columbus Avenue and then up the side, one thing we know is that uh, However we get there, we get to a certain elevation above uh, uh, sea level, which in this case is uh, about uh, 35 meters, I believe. Um, we're going to get to a height, and it doesn't matter what route we took, we get to a height. Um, and so the height is a state variable. There are lots of things associated that are also state variables. For example, the XY position, or otherwise known as longitude and latitude, doesn't matter what route I took to get there, I get to my final destination, which is the Prospect Hill Monument, the tower. Um, so the longitude, latitude, the altitude, those are all state variables. I don't care if you came on a helicopter or if you uh, came on the back of a red wagon. Once you get up there, you're there. Those are all uh, state variables. Now, you can ask the question of how am I going to get there? Um, uh, and you can say, I'm going to count my steps, uh, pedometer, I'm going to count my steps. Then it makes a whole lot of a difference how you got there, right? Depending on what route you took. So the number of steps you take to get to your final destination, well, the number of steps, well, that's what we would call a path variable. So we can see that uh, here if we're trying to get ourselves up to the uh, top where the monument is. We got a couple of uh, choices about how to uh, get there. We could just go straight up. That might be the most steep and it might have the fewest number of uh, steps. Um, or we could make a decision to try and do it a little bit more uh, relaxing. So uh, we might uh, 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 start out over here and say, well, okay, that looks a little steep. We'll go around. And then we'll try to come up gently a little bit, maybe. Come up this way a little bit, maybe. And maybe this is a little bit gentler approach. We have to try it. Maybe that's a little gentler approach. And that's a little gentler approach. Okay, so we get to the same destination, same latitude, altitude, longitude, but our variable number of steps is much different depending on how we do it. So that's kind of a visualization of how to think about it path variables and state variables. Let's review that concept again. The same location, but this time we have a classic uh, contour map like you might use when you go hiking, where this is the 50 line. And in this case, uh, it's an American map, so that's 50 uh, feet. 
And then we have the 100 contour line up here, 100 feet above sea level. That's where we're trying to get to. That's where the, that's where the tower is. Uh, 100 feet, about 30 meters. That's the tower. Um, and then we have the, 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 all of the contours, okay, in between 50 feet, 60 feet, 70 feet, 80 feet. Uh, again, we have the same uh, choice to make. Uh, are we going to go um, straight up the hill and pass those contour contours quickly? So that's going to be fewer, fewer steps. Um, we get to our destination faster, or are we going to try and follow these contours and do something a little bit more gentle? There are no actual roads here, so we might be going through people's backyards, but do something a little bit more gentle to get there. So the hike's not quite as aggressive an elevation gain because we're going across the contours more slowly, but we have to do a lot more steps in consequence to get to our destination. So uh, uh, height associated with uh, height, of course, is also to get myself there. Let's just use a round number, 100 kilograms. Um, 100 kilograms, 30 meters. I can tell you the gravitational potential energy that I gained to get there. Again, independent of the two paths that I might have taken. I don't care about the path or maybe I just parachuted in uh, off an Air Force demo uh, to get to my tower. Um, doesn't matter how I got there. I have a certain height associated with that. I have a certain gravitational potential energy. If I stand up there and enjoy the view of Boston, then I have no kinetic energy. Um, although I had some kinetic energy when I was walking, that doesn't matter. I just have my final standing on top of the tower, looking out of Boston, zero kinetic energy, some gravitational potential energy. Um, I, I don't have any electric potential energy because I'm not uh, charged up, no magnetic potential energy. Um, but my uh, a number of steps really matters which way I went. Um, uh, so that's the path variable. Now we're going to talk about uh, translation of that idea into some of our thermodynamic quantities where the path variables are really the heat interactions and the work interactions. And that's what's challenging for uh, folks who are new to thermodynamics to really come to terms with. So we're going to step through some more examples. To get us started thinking about a specific example, let's look at the raising of a weight. We're going to have a pulley involved, a rope, a weight, and we're going to use, we could use a lot of things to provide the necessary force to lift this weight against gravity. We're going to use an electric motor. Why do I like the electric motor? Well, I like the electric motor because it runs on electricity. And with current and voltage, I can multiply them to get power or joules per second. Uh, and I can connect that to, say, cost of electricity. Choo -choo, choo -choo. Um, but it gives, we could use a horse, we could use a person pulling. Um, those are all more complex phenomena than just thinking about a current and a voltage. I think it's easy to think of that. And we're going to put this in, in the end, we're going to put this uh, motor into the surroundings. So it doesn't much matter where we get our force from since it's in the surroundings. And by definition, we're interested in the system and not the surroundings. Nevertheless, having something specific in mind, um, uh, like an electric motor, um, that we can think of joules as associated with cost of electricity, gives us uh, something a bit more tangible to think about, I think. All right, so we have this electric motor pulling on the rope over the pulley and pulling up the uh, weight against the force of gravity. In raising the weight, we can think about first its initial state. Um, its initial state, well, uh, it's at the bottom um, and it doesn't have uh, any uh, uh, noticeable to us kinetic energy. Um, we'll define the bottom as the zero point with respect to gravitational potential energy. We're, we're free to make that choice. Um, and it has a mass. Now, uh, it also doesn't have uh, uh, it, well, it has an internal energy, um, depending on what temperature it is. We'll take uh, the room temperature, uh, say 298 Kelvin, and we'll also define that as our zero point for internal energy. So we choose in our initial state to make the declaration of a kinetic energy of zero, a gravitational potential energy of zero, and a internal energy of zero. We choose to make that declaration. Um, you can imagine doing the uh, raising of the weight. We could have our setup with the pulley. 
We could have it at the ground level. We could have it at the top of a skyscraper. We could have it at different elevations. And if we were thinking of that with respect to the planet Earth, we might think of different gravitational potential energies as our starting point. Um, but that's not what matters to us. What matters is to us is the starting point. And so we choose to define at the starting point because we're going to be looking at differences. We're going to be looking at differences. So it doesn't matter what our starting point is because we're actually going to be looking at the difference in gravitational potential energy, the difference in kinetic energy, the difference in internal energy. So a convenient definition at the initial state is just to set them all uh, equal to zero. Okay, so we've done that. Now, we begin lifting the weight. Um, as we do that, it goes up in the gravitational field. So uh, by difference, the gravitational potential energy starts to increase. It's moving, so it's got some uh, kinetic uh, energy. Um, we didn't change the temperature at all, though we're in a friction, in this case, a frictionless environment, uh, a perfect motor, perfect pulley, um, no heat interactions. We're just pulling that weight up against the force of gravity. So there's no change in internal energy. Um, that's the, uh, the process that it passes through, the path that it passes through. Then it gets to the end, it gets to the top. So the top is what we call the final state. Uh, and at that point, relative to the initial state, there's no change in kinetic energy because it comes to a stop. Um, so delta kinetic energy is zero. Um, there is a change in the gravitational potential energy. We know how to calculate that. We take the height difference, we take the mass of the block, and we take the acceleration due to uh, gravity, and that's its new gravitational potential uh, energy. Uh, and again, uh, there was no change in temperature, no friction, nothing going on there, so the internal energy is unchanged. So we have some technical words that we've introduced here. We've got an initial state, we've got a final state, and those two states are connected by a pathway or a process. In this case, it was uh, the lifting uh, upward of uh, the weight. We could have done that in many different ways, actually. Um, we just did the straightforward lifting it up. Um, but whatever pathway or process we followed, we could have just had fun. Lift the weight, drop the weight, lift the weight, drop the weight, lift the weight. And we would have been to the same final state. So the initial state, kinetic energy, Gravitational potential energy, internal energy, all defined by us in this case is zero. And the final state of all of those quantities, um, that's independent of the path. Um, that's independent of the process that we follow. The difference in those quantities between the initial state and the final state connected by a path, uh, a process. Now, to continue further in the thermodynamic analysis, uh, any thermodynamic analysis uh, consists of an interaction between system and surroundings or a more complicated setup system one interacting with system two, both of them interacting with surroundings. Um, but at the core, we've got a system and a surroundings. That means we need to make a choice and it's a non-unique choice. How do we make the choice? We decide what we're interested in. So we're interested in this case, I'm interested, I hope you're interested, I make the choice that I'm interested in, the weight or the cement block. Um, and that's going to be my system. So I draw a red box around it, and that's my system. And it's interacting with the surroundings. In this case, the surroundings has a generator and a pulley in it, but I don't need to know that. Um, I don't even care because in the surroundings, and by definition, I don't care. So as I look at the analysis of the system, I see that my mass is in its initial state, and I see that the mass is in its final state at elevation, and I can look at the difference in gravitational potential energy uh, between those two states. Uh, just to use a round number, let's call that number 100, 100 joules. Uh, 100 joules of gravitational potential energy difference, no change in kinetic energy, it's a stop block initial state, stop block final state, no interactions, no friction, uh, no heat interactions. Its internal energy is uh, unchanged. Um, no other forms of internal energy in this block except for uh, uh, the possibility of thermal energy. Um, at other times, you can have other types of internal energy inside uh, uh, the system. Um, but for our case, it's all just thermal and related to uh, the heat capacity. So there's no change in that. Okay, so we know what the change in the gravitational potential energy is. 
100 joules. But let's ask the question of uh, the work that was associated with that change from initial state to final state. Um, we have some uh, further scenarios we consider. Let's start by uh, mapping this out with an equation. So we have uh, an initial state, which we'll use an I for the initial state. And we have a final state for which we'll use the F, the final state. And we'll be interested in difference quantities. So for example, we'll be interested in the change in kinetic energy of the system, which should be the uh, kinetic energy in the final state minus the kinetic energy in the initial state. The change in the gravitational potential energy uh, should be uh, the potential energy in the final state, uh, gravitational, and the potential energy in the initial state, and so on and uh, so forth. And in these examples, we've chosen the initial state just as uh, giving it zero, but you can see it doesn't much matter what value we gave it for initial kinetic energy, initial potential energy, so on and so forth. Um, it doesn't much matter what we gave it because we're always going to be looking at uh, difference quantities. And all of these are for the system. Sometimes we leave off the SYS label just uh, for shorthand, um, but uh, it's always it's always in there. All right. Now, in the particular examples we're looking at here between the initial state and the final state, uh, we have the, the change in energy of uh, the system. And... That's always going to be the system and surrounding heat interactions plus the system and surrounding work interactions. Um, that equation, uh, as written, is uh, complete. And then we can think about change what types of energy we might conceptualize within the system. And the ones we're interested in today are kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and internal energy. So those are the quantities that we'll discuss. So Q plus W, representing the change in energy of the system, gets uh, 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 compartmentalized across kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and internal energy. We will actually see in all of our examples today that there's no kinetic energy difference. Everything is still between the initial and the final states. But along the path, there are things like a moving pulley or a, a moving weight. Um, so we'll just keep that kinetic energy term in there so that we're always uh, uh, thinking about it a bit, even though it's not, it's always going to be zero in all of the examples that we look at since everything is still at the initial and final states. All right, in this first example, uh, we saw that there was no change in kinetic energy. There was no change in uh, internal energy. Uh, we only have uh, uh, the thermal type of internal energy here, meaning heat capacity coupled to temperature change. Um, and we saw that there was 100 units, we said 100 joules, 100 units of potential energy, gravity change. And all of this coming from the uh, external motor, well, that was all work. So we have in this example that the heat interaction is zero and the work interaction is 100 joules. That leads to the change in uh, the gravitational potential energy. Okay, so we lifted the block and we said that that uh, corresponded to 100 joules of increased uh, gravitational potential energy. And that 100 joules uh, uh, came from the surroundings, the electric motor, ching, 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 ching. The, I think of it as we had to pay for that. Um, yeah, so we had a 100 joule work interaction between the system and the uh, surroundings. Now let's suppose that pulley uh, uh, is a little bit realistic. It's no longer frictionless. Um, okay, so now we go from the initial to the final state. Um, what's the change in uh, gravitational potential energy? What's the work interaction? Well, it's still exactly 100 joules in both cases because that pulley is out in the surroundings. And so we don't care about it. We're focused on the system the way we've drawn it. Um, it could be true if we were thinking about the electric motor, ching, 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 that uh, it actually has to say, come up with 101 joules where one joule goes into the friction of the pulley. Um, but we don't care about that. That's all out in the surroundings. From our perspective, the way we've drawn it, initial to final state, there was a 100 joule uh, uh, work interaction. Now, suppose that 
uh, pulley is really, really rusted over. And uh, that electric motor actually had to do 110 joules. Um, well, 10 joules goes into the rusty pulley. Um, but the system, well, we don't know anything about that. That's all out in the surroundings. All we know is that the system, its gravitational potential energy increased by 100 joules, and it was a work interaction of 100 joules with the surroundings. All of that business about uh, the, the, the rusty pulley and so on and so forth, so all the surroundings, we don't care about any of those details. Um, we drew a red box, that's our boundary system surroundings, and there was a 100 uh, joule work interaction um, that increased the gravitational potential energy by 100 joules. That's it. In this example, we see the same result. Uh, the change in gravitational potential energy is 100 joules. We drew the system box where we drew it, so whatever's going on with the pulley is outside the box, we don't care. And there's 100 joules of work done on uh, uh, the system leading to its change in gravitational potential energy. Until now, uh, we've had uh, a perfect pulley. Uh, let's describe the scenario with a little bit more detail now. Let's, let's consider a perfect pulley, a pulley that's a little rusty, a little friction, um, and then a pulley that's more rusty and a lot of friction. Well, what does that mean? That means if we're exerting this external force um, from the surroundings, in this case with the electric motor, uh, the force we have to apply to lift that block is the combination of the force against gravity and the force against this uh, 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 rusty, older pulley. Okay, so if that's our scenario, let's change our definition of the system. Let's now define the system as including both the pulley and the block. So the initial state, um, the uh, 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 block is at the, the bottom and zero kinetic energy, zero gravitational potential energy, um, an initial internal energy given by the temperature. And then as we lift that block, if there is no friction on the pulley, so perfect world, then nothing from our earlier system description changes. At the final state, the pulley is the pulley. It has no, it didn't change height, it didn't change kinetic energy. Um, there was no friction, so it didn't change temperature. So the pulley's just inside the box, but didn't contribute anything to the story. And the change in the system uh, energy is all tied up into the gravitational potential energy of the weight. That's still uh, 100 joules of work interaction between system and surroundings. The, the, in the initial state compared to the final state, the pulley didn't change at all. Still has the same kinetic energy, still has the same gravitational potential energy, still has uh, the same internal energy. Uh, meanwhile, the other part of the system, the block, its uh, uh, gravitational potential energy increased by 100 joules. Um, initial final state, 100 joules of work interaction with the surroundings. Now you bring in the realistic pulley. In the case of the realistic pulley, we're going to say uh, that to, to go round and round, there's some friction, and that's going to be uh, one joule. All right, so how do we think about that? This is where things get uh, subtle. Okay, well, the block part of the system, again, didn't change. It has 100 joules of gravitational potential energy. The pulley part of the system, we're going to say, uh, uh, because the realistic pulley has some friction, we're going to call that one joule. All right, so now what happened there? Well, that generator needs to now provide 101 joules of work energy action. Uh, one joule to overcome the friction on the pulley and 100 joules to overcome the gravitational potential energy. Now, okay, so we have a work interaction of 101 joules. Where is that one joule on the pulley? It's not in its gravitational potential energy. After we lift the block, it's not in kinetic energy. That one joule went into the internal energy. And that implies that the pulley's temperature went up. So what do we do about that? Well, this analysis is kind of a step one, step two. Step one, we had 101 joules of work interaction. And the pulley's temperature goes up because it takes in one joule because of friction. Now, what do we do with the rest of our scenario? Well, let's suppose that we want to keep temperature the same. That means that that pulley that just got hot uh, because of the one joule that was added, in step two, it has to have a heat interaction with the surroundings. It needs to reject that one joule back to the surroundings. 
So we had 101 joules of uh, positive work interaction into the system in step one. And then in step two, we have heat rejection, negative one joule of a heat interaction back out into the surroundings. So from the surroundings point of view, that uh, was 101 joules of work in, uh, one joule of heat interaction out. And by the time you get to the final state of the system, well, that pulley then, by giving up that one joule in heat interaction, has gone back to its original state. And the um, uh, block is sitting there with 100 joules of gravitational potential energy. Now, let's go with that old rusty pulley that you really got to put a lot of force on to make it turn. Um, let's take it, that takes now instead of one joule, let's say it takes 10 joules to get it turning while you're lifting the weight. So, uh, that electric generator now has to provide 10 joules of work for the pulley and 100 joules of work for the uh, block going up into the gravitational field. So, that electric motor is now. Um, 110 joules of work interaction between the system and surroundings. So ching, 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 you're now paying for 110 joules. Um, again, that 10 joules shows up in the pulley. Um, if we say that we're going to keep things at the same temperature, those 10 joules come out as a negative 10 work interaction. So overall, the system again, the pulley cools off again, the block is up at 100 joules. So overall, after step one of pulling on the rusty pulley and step two of letting it have a heat interaction, we're back to pulley is unchanged. The block is at uh, 100 joules of gravitational potential energy. Um, there was a heat interaction, and I'm sorry, there was a work interaction in step one of 110 joules. You had to pay for that money, ching, 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 off the power uh, uh, current voltage uh, from the electric motor. Um, uh, so from the uh, system surroundings boundary, there was 110 joules of work in, it, followed by 10 joules of uh, rejected heat, so to speak, and negative heat interaction from uh, the system. Okay, in this example, by making a larger system, we have a bit of change in the analysis. First of all, again, initial final, no change in kinetic uh, energy. We're going to break this down into uh, step one and step two. In uh, step one, that realistic pulley, well, to get things to happen, we had to provide some extra force, uh, an overall 101 joules of work. That changed the potential uh, energy and also we said um, showed up um, as internal energy which with its heat capacity led to a temperature rise but then we said there was a second step where we're going to allow the pulley to equilibrate its uh, temperature um, and so when that happens the gravitational potential energy doesn't change uh, at all um, but the internal energy goes down and that happens as a, uh, a, a heat interaction and so we see that in this example the work interaction was 101 joules the heat interaction was minus one joules and at the end of the day the change in energy of the system uh, after uh, the, the two steps one, pulling on it, and two, allowing the temperature to equilibrate with the surroundings, the change in energy in the system, was all attributed to the change in gravitational potential energy, or 100 joules. This example is completely analogous with the, with the rusted pulley. Um, at the end of the day, we're going to have after uh, pulling and then allowing temperature to equilibrate, we're going to end up with having a change in energy of the system, a change in gravitational potential energy, 100 joules uh, uh, for energy of the system, 100 joules for gravitational potential energy. But the key difference now is that we had work of 110 joules, we had a heat interaction of negative 10 joules, and so we see through this set of three examples, our uh, state functions are the same, but depending on how we did it with, a, with an ideal pulley, a realistic pulley, or a rusted pulley, we got different levels of uh, uh, work and heat interaction, path variables. Okay, so reviewing those cases, we see first the importance of the definition of the system. Is it just going to be what we're interested in? Is it just going to be around the block? In that case, we lifted the block. In every scenario we considered, it was just 100 joules of work interaction because all we were interested in was the block. But then we said, well, no, really, actually, the pulley is part of what we're interested in, too. We decided that. Um, we didn't have to decide that. We just decided that. 
So then we drew the system around the, around the pulley and the weight. In that case, we got some different permutations depending on whether it was an ideal frictionless pulley, if it was kind of a realistic pulley, or if it was an old rusted over uh, pulley. In all cases, um, uh, we let the, uh, the, the pulley stay at the same temperature, meaning if it if it got hot, so to speak, by depositing joules into it, we allowed it then to cool off. So that meant in all cases, the, uh, the system uh, in the end uh, increased its gravitational potential energy by 100 joules. But there are some differences. In the case of the uh, frictionless pulley, the electric motor, uh, 100 joules, that's what we had to pay for, ching, 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 in electricity. Realistic pulley, we had to pay for 101 joules of uh, electric work, ching, ching, ching. And in the case of a rusted over pulley, we had to pay for 110 joules, ching, ching, ching. Um, so we see how the amount of work uh, that gets done depends on our system uh, description. Um, the amount of heat interaction that occurs depends on our system description. Um, uh, but at the end of the day, the gravitational potential energy, which is a state function, is uh, 100 joules, uh, increases by 100 joules across all three scenarios, um, even as each of those different scenarios um, had a different heat and work interaction. Uh, frictionless pulley, we gave it uh, zero heat interaction, positive 100 work interaction. Realistic pulley, we gave it 101 work interaction, negative one heat interaction. Rusted over pulley, we gave it 110 uh, work interaction, negative 10 uh, heat interaction. And though the system doesn't uh, care about it because at the end of the day, it's just 100 joules positive. If you're paying the electricity bill, uh, thinking a little about the surroundings, you do care about it because of different amounts of current voltage that, that were needed for those different cases. A couple 